I was a flight lieutenant in the Royal Air Force and privileged to fly these aeroplanes, the Lightning, in the 1980s. And it's uh, approximately 34 years ago that I last flew this aeroplane. So it's a real privilege to be sitting in the left-hand seat of this two-seater uh, right now. I believe it still smells of testosterone and kerosene in here. Uh, and that's how I remember it, uh, a really high-performance jet. The principal job of the aeroplane was at that time was to sit on QRA or quick reaction alert really to be a policeman and, and police disguise around around the UK um, and that we did effectively this aeroplane did it very effectively for about 30 years but it was on one grey horrible night when I was holding Q, Q2 in fact uh, just as the backup pilot and Q1 had been scrambled earlier on in the day and had a long a long sortie Dick Heath punch my colleague I'd come back from that sortie and we reported it and we expected the rest of the evening to be quite quiet. Um, I was still dressed in my gear, ready to go as now Q1 and went to bed, uh, expecting a quiet night, uh, only to be scrambled from bed with the bells and whistles going at one o'clock in the morning. And some five minutes later, I was getting airborne in one of these aeroplanes at Bimbrook on the most filthy night. It was raining, it was very windy very low cloud and I definitely left my brain back in the uh, in the crew room by the time I was rotating this aeroplane into the air. Shortly after uh, we got into the air, gear and flap up, I had an electrical failure on the aeroplane, didn't like being involved in wet weather conditions and it was certainly wet that day, uh, which meant that I was back flying on very basic standby instruments with no radar and uh, a certain amount of uh, checks to be done before I could get the generators back online and uh, and get into normal operations because I had to go and find a tanker and thereafter with that tanker and refuel I had to go and find some Russians uh, who were already up north of Scotland and were causing some bother so sometime later about two or three hours later I'd taken my fuel or everything was back to normal and I was taking photographs of uh, these Russian aeroplanes uh, I was really quite close up my problem was that I hadn't recognised how far I was from the UK by this stage. We were heading out across into the Atlantic through the Iceland Faroes Gap where this aeroplane is not designed to go. It's too short range for that. Um, but I had tanker support and I was just finishing off my QRA duties of the uh, photography when the radar system, which here is on the left hand side, uh, but actually on my single seater was on the right hand side over here, decided to disintegrate um, and burst into flames, which was more than a little bit disconcerting because I wasn't quite sure where I was at that stage, but I did know that I was too far away from home, too far away from the tanker, um, with no radar support, uh, with a cockpit fire. And very quickly, my QRA sortie became sort of a, uh, a dash for self-preservation, really. Um, I had to find some way of getting back my only way of getting back was to find the tanker. I had to do that using mental maths, mental de dead reckoning. Uh, I still had a radio, but I was still wondering whether I was gonna um, die in a fire, uh, whether I was gonna be hypoxic, whether I was gonna blow the canopy off, whether I was gonna eject into a very rough, cold sea and probably never to be seen again. So all those things were going through my mind and I was not unlike a lot of Lightning pilots at that time who'd had some difficulty at some time uh, with their aeroplane or their operation. I'm still here, so it worked out in the end, but I was quite frightened, I have to say, uh, even as a young man, and we were supposed to be um, quite strong in terms of uh, independence, and as a fighter pilot, you were supposed to be able to deal with most, most things. Um, but it was one of those occasions where it really made you wonder about the decision making that you'd gone through, uh, whether actually you had made any decisions consciously and quite often um, as I did on that uh, on that occasion I recognised that the decisions that I made subconsciously were were incorrect and I, I put myself too far ahead and too far away from safety uh, for my own good. Um, the superior pilot should rely on his superior judgment to avoid situations that require the use of his superior skill. Uh, I barely managed that day I have to say. I'll, I'll never forget that particular one um, and I've taken that through along with other stories um, through the best part of 40 years aviation career which is both uh, in the military and outside in, in civilian and a civilian guys as an instructor as an examiner but these basic experiences are the things that define you I think uh, and certainly 
it's not something that I would wish to revisit, uh, not for real, but I've certainly revisited that particular uh, episode and a num number of other similar ones. Um, all Lightning Pilots have their, their own individual stories. I've revisited those on a, my own on a number of occasions. Glad that I've come through them. Simple as that. I have to say, it was a heavy, heady mix of exhilaration, amazement, performance, um, hard work, hard, hard work, privilege um, and dependency on others because you could not do the job on your own. Um, you absolutely defend, defended your position but by working as a team, maybe just as a two or as a four or as a mixed fighter element um, and obviously working with uh, experts on the ground as well at GCI, at the intercept controllers. So yeah, you were part of a team, simple as that. Yeah. So uh, I feel amazingly privileged not only to have done it uh, in those days, but to be revisiting this particular aeroplane now, some 34, 35 years later. Yeah. Some of those memories are not particularly great. I spent most of my time in, in this particular aeroplane in the right hand seat here uh, as an instructor. and. On the right-hand seat, the controls are the other way around to where you would normally be flying the aeroplane as a single-seater. So you had new skills to learn in the right-hand seat um, because quite obviously you were working the radar with, a, with a, the opposite hand, the stick and the thrust levers with the opposite hands as well. Um, so this was a challenge on top of challenge, if you like, uh, to fly this and teach effectively on this aeroplane. Um, I would say that one of the things that I solely remember is where the fuel gauges are on this aeroplane because you could, in combat, see those fuel gauges empty uh, and actually see the needles move. You could empty one of these of effective fuel within 15 to 20 minutes easily if you were doing combat uh, fairly close to the ground, around about 10,000 feet in burner. Yeah, 15, 15 20 minutes. Um, but on the other hand, I've sat in one of these for six, seven hours and tanked seven or eight times on the way to Cyprus and coming back from Saudi Arabia as well. And from those occasions, I remember just how uncomfortable the seat is. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, mixed emotions. Uh, delight to be able to sit in here, amazed that uh, all these instruments are still intact, generally. Um, so privileged that I've got my name down here on the front. Um, and completely amazed that there are people that are enthusiastic enough to to manage the restoration of icons like this. Um, this is a part of British aviation history when the best aeroplanes were made uh, in Britain. This is an English electric British aerospace aeroplane and there isn't anything quite like it. It was a world beater in his time. Uh, it was still pretty good when I was flying it in terms of its engine and air, airframe performance, not many could match it apart from the more modern uh, aeroplanes, F-16 onwards, F-15s, F-18s. But for when it was designed and built, it is unbelievable. Yeah. Served at Binbrook on 11 Squadron, then uh, I was moved to um, the Lightning Training Flight, and then back to 11 Squadron when the Lightning Training Flight uh, finished. Ian Black was the last pilot to go through there and I was Ian's instructor for a while and then back onto the squadron at 11 until uh, the last squadron to operate here was 11 squadron and 11 squadron folded in the summer of 88 uh, so yeah I was here from 83 to 88 um, all my time in the lightning was here at Bimbrook, lightning town